Good morning. Welcome to worship on this, the third Sunday of Advent. And actually it's the, the pink candle, which is actually the candle of joy. And it's to, so it's sort of known as the shepherd's candle, where the shepherds had the good news of great joy that comes with Jesus. And welcome to worship. I'm Pastor David Hara. Um, and I've been here once a month and I've been here around so I think most of you recognize me so it's great to be back here again today and my sermon today is on the gospel reading and it's about John and we find him in an unusual spot he's not by the Jordan baptizing he's not in the desert eating locusts and wild honey he's in jail and actually as I worked on the sermon I sort of titled it Doing Time, John Doing Time. And we'll talk about that as as we gather this morning. But our call to worship, this is about John from Isaiah 40. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough gown shall become level, the rugged places plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed. Trusting in the word of life given in our baptism, we are gathered together today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's rise, if you are able, for our opening song. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we gather for worship this morning, we praise you for sending Jesus to be our Savior. We thank you that you have loved us with an everlasting love and have chosen us to be your people. Lord, you promised you would come. You came and you promised you are coming back in all your glory. Bless our worship as we prepare to celebrate your birth once again. In your precious name, amen. Please be seated. Let us now confess our sins and receive God's forgiveness. O Lord Jesus, the glory and beauty of your eternal home gives me hope for all my tomorrows. Yet unless you are Lord of my life, reigning as king, I will get in the way of you being Lord of the church. My own selfish ideas 
and personal theologies tear down what you build up. Forgive me, Lord, and give me a new vision for your kingdom. Praise God, for the precious word of the Lord is faithful and true. To those who confess with penitent hearts, God forgives us and calls us his children. Washed clean in his blood, we can stand before his throne rejoicing. In the name of Jesus, I declare to you that you are forgiven. Amen. We join in the Listen, God is Calling. Good morning. Let's have all the boys and girls come up for our... Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all. Good morning. All right. Are we one thumbs up or two today? What do we got? We got one. We got two. Lots of thumbs ups. Good, good, good. So today's children's message, good morning. Come on in is about a special word, it's kind of a funny word, and it's called grumble. What do you think the word grumble means? Yeah. Yeah, it could be that you're mad, yep. Yeah, like, like you just kind of, you heard the term like a grumble in my tummy, like your tummy's kind of upset. So before we get into that, I want to tell you the, yes, what do you think? Yeah, people get mad. I, I agree with that. So we have the word grumble. We're going to put that aside just for a second. And I'm going to ask you about a farmer. So what do farmers do? Yeah. They grow crops. Some farmers take care of animals too. So they kind of grow food for us, right? You can put your hand down. They grow food for us. So today's Bible lesson that the pastor is going to read to us today, it's about uh, a little bit about farmers a little bit about patience and a little bit about grumbling. Now, a farmer, they can, one who like grows plants that we can eat, like corn or wheat, they have a little seed and they put it in the ground and they water it and they take care of it. How long do you think that takes? Yeah. Thousands of years? Okay. Could take a year. A few months. Well, typically, um, I'm not a farmer, but typically farmers do like to, to plant their crops in the spring, and they grow in the spring, and they grow during the summer, then they harvest everything over the fall. That's why we call it fall harvest. You've probably heard of that. So I think a few months is the right answer, maybe six to nine months. And after a farmer puts his seed in the ground to grow that, you know, the wheat or the corn, he has to water it, and he has to make sure that the weeds are, you know, pull the weeds and things like that. And he has to have a lot of patience. Why does he have to have a lot of patience? Yep. That's right. There's, there's really nothing to do. Why do you think he has the patience? The, the farmer has to. The farmer has to wait. Why? And that takes a lot of patience. Why do you think? Yep. It does. And sometimes we want things to happen like really fast right away. And patience takes discipline. And what happens if we're not patient? Yeah, we complain. Yep. That's right. And that gets us back to the grumble word. So if we're not patient, if we don't have that, that discipline to be able to wait, then we start grumbling. And then we start getting 
angry. And then we start getting in fights with each other. And maybe sometimes the farmer, um, it's just not, he doesn't get enough rain or just things are happening. But we have to be patient. We have to wait for the seed to grow and we have to wait for the harvest. So in the Bible study today, Paul is writing to some people who are getting really impatient. And they're like, we want to see more results. We want to see more people in church. We want, to see, we want to see all the fruits of everything that we're doing. We want to see it now. And Paul's saying, stop your grumbling and just be patient. Just wait for God because God has a plan. And I understand sometimes like I get grumbly and I, I get impatient also. But we just have to be able to take a deep breath. And know that God has a plan. Sometimes when we pray, God says yes. Sometimes God says no. And sometimes God says, you're going to have to wait. So we need to remember that. So when we want something now, we want something big in our lives, sometimes we just have to be patient, not grumble like the Bible says, and just wait on God's plan. It's hard to do, but waiting on God's plan is always worth it. Would you agree with that? I think so. All right, let's close in prayer. So everyone fold your hands, and we're going to do the repetitive prayer. You just repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father thank, you for today. thank you for today. Help us to be patient, us to be patient. And, wait for your and wait for your blessings. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you very much for listening this morning. You may go back to your seats. Our first reading this morning is taken from the book of James, the fifth chapter, beginning at the seventh verse. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near, is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise for our gospel reading. The Holy Gospel is written in the 11th chapter of St. Matthew, beginning at the second verse. Glory to thee, O Lord. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to them, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered, answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We sing hymn 344, verses 1 and 3. Grace, mercy, and peace from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day. Bring to us this season the joy of the event that shook the foundations of this world. Christ entering. Thank you for those who prepare the way. Notably, John, this day. And we look to you in faith and hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you know, I, I remember a story. It's sort of about pastors. You know, pastors can be very intuitive in learning people, listening and watching and understanding people. And this one pastor, is a while back, and it was, you know, back then, sometimes pastors were given gifts and sometimes not enough money, but just given gifts by members of their church. Sort of like farmers giving a, chicken to the pastor but this pastor was receiving some presents at Christmas and a box first came a box and you know it was from a family that owned a candy store and before opening the box he looked at it and this who saw who it was from and you know he guessed it was candy he opened it up it was candy a lot of it then he got another present from a family that owned a butcher's a meat market this was a heavy box, and he opened that up, and there was a wide variety of meat in there. And then all of a sudden, he saw another present, a young boy from a family, about 10 years old, coming with this pretty big box, struggling to carry it. And he asked him, I got a present for you. What do you think it is? And he looked in the corner of the box. It was a little bit wet probably some leakage in there, and he said, right, let me guess, some bottles of wine. And the little boy said, no. And then he put his finger where the leakage was and he tasted champagne. And the little boy said, no, it's not champagne. And he said, well, what is it? A puppy! You know, things are not always like you expect them to be, you know, and you can look at the world and make expectations. Do you know, I thought of that when I was working on the sermon this week, thinking about John the Baptist. And John is, is, is the prophet of Advent. He's the one who prepares the way. He's the only person in the New Testament they talk about his clothing. And what does he wear? A leather belt and a camel haired clothing. Really, it, that's got to be the itchiest clothing you could ever make. And there's diet. What is it? Locusts and wild honey. And he's out at the Jordan River, River preaching a, and a baptism of repentance. 
And the people go out of their way to see him, to hear him, and then to repent. He prepares people for the one who's coming after him, who he says, you know what, I'm not even worthy to untie the thongs of his sandals. The king, the Messiah. And you know, he's, he knew his role was going to decrease. But you know, I, I bet there's a part of him thinking, you know what, in the new kingdom, I'm going to be the king's prophet. I'm going to be there and it's going to be unlike anything this world has ever seen. But what happens to John? Where is he in Matthew chapter 11? He's in jail. He's in jail because he, he preached a sermon that offended the king and queen. Now, King Herod, who was around, well, you know, you're here, you're here on Christmas Eve and Christmas when Jesus was born, had some sons who were, they divided the kingdom up in three. And one of his sons married his niece, but one of his other sons took a shine to her and stole him, her away from his brother. And John gave a sermon and said, you know what? You don't steal your brother's wife. Let alone who's your niece, both of your nieces, you know, both your niece. And he gave a sermon and said to the king, you don't do this kind of thing. And you know what the king and queen said, you know... We don't want to hear anybody talking bad about us. So they locked up John in prison just to shut him up. No more sermons, no more crowds, no more bad-mouthing the king and queen. And you know, when I, when I think about prison, I've never been in prison. Do you know they have a description about prison? You know what they call it? Doing time. And you know, we have a lot of expressions about time. You know, we, we pass time. You know, sometimes, you know, if I've got to wait, you know, I have my iPad with me almost all the time. I can read, I can, you know, all sorts of things. Even got games on there. We also have killing time. And, you know, killing time is something, you know, when it's, it's not a pleasant situation. Maybe if you're waiting. How many of you love waiting? I don't see a single hand out there. Nobody loves waiting. And when we got to wait, sometimes we kill time. And we do that. Here's one we all do, though. Wasting time. Have you ever wasted time? Hey, I, I, can, I do that well every day. You know, there's certain things just, you know, you just putter around and you think after an hour later, you think, what have I done? I really haven't done anything. Wasting time. But John the Baptist is in a cell... He's doing time. And that sounds miserable, you know, doing time. He's locked away in a cell and he's thinking about all that's going on. And he's thinking, I, I was sure that Jesus was the one. When he baptized him, all these things happened. And, and life isn't going the way I expected it to. I'm in jail. So he sent a couple of his disciples to Jesus and asked him, are you the one or should we wait for somebody else? And you know, the Old Testament reading for this day, um, you know, it had the, the prophecy of the Messiah. And you know what it says? This is from Matt, Isaiah 35. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb, dumb say. That's the messianic age and that's what the Messiah would do. <clears throat> it's interesting, Jesus sent the disciples back and said, tell John what's happening. The blind regain their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the good news proclaimed to them. Do you know what the promise was, you know, these healings? But Jesus always gives more than anybody expects or even scripture promises. Jesus gives, you know, lepers being cleansed. Good news being preached to the poor. And even the d dead are raised from the grave. Do you know what? 
there's a description, you know, I talked about time, how you can pass time, waste time, kill time, do time. Do you know in the scriptures, the, the normal definition of time is called chronos in, in the Greek. It's called chronos. That's normal time. There's a, a, a term for a special time, and it's, it's this Greek word named kairos. And this time, it's, it's sort of like God's time, when God is active. When God is doing something incredible. And in the whole life of Jesus, you know what it is? It's Kairos time. Because God is doing something incredible. Very, very <coughs> incredible. Because all these things are happening. Do you know one of the things <coughs> with John, and I think with all of us, how does Jesus describe John? The greatest individual among people who have been born of women. That's a pretty lofty stature, right? He describes John as the greatest person of those born among women. And you know, when you think of the greatest, you know, what is he doing? He's, he's doing time. He's in prison. Do you know there's an age-old question that, it, that people ask, and you know, what's, it's, you know, why do bad things happen to good people? Do you know what you think? John, he's, the great, he's this great prophet, and what's happening to him now? He's in prison. And you know what, even more, you know, you know what happens to him in the future. The queen's daughter dances at a party. King drinks a little bit too much. And the king says to the girl dancing, I'll give you whatever you want up to half of my kingdom. And what does her mom tell her to ask for? The head of John the Baptist on a platter. So ultimately, no, you know, we know what happens to John. He's doing time until they take off his head one day. Do you know, bad things happen to good people. And you know, all of us have experienced hard times in life. A life of faith doesn't mean you have a life without problems, without struggles. Do you know, I was just, th just thinking about it. Well, what, what are some, some bad times? And you know, what the, one of the first things that came when I was working on the sermon, I was thinking about... Um, a famous pastor in the United States. His name is Rick Warren. He's a pastor of a church out in California. He's sort of retiring now, too. Um, and he and his, he, he's famous for writing two books. The first book he wrote was for pastors, and it didn't sell that many copies. It was called The Purpose Driven Church. And it was a book designed for pastors. There's, there's a lot fewer of us pastors to read the book. It sold pretty well for a pastor-oriented book. But it, you know, didn't that well. But it did all right, but not great. But then he did a follow-up book to that purpose-driven church. And the follow-up book he wrote was called The, the Purpose-Driven Life. And that was geared towards everybody. And you know what? That book, I think it sold like 40 to 50 million copies. And, you know, it sort of became sort of relatively famous. But it was about nine years ago... After all that happened in incredible notoriety, they have three kids, and one of their kids always had some mental issues and problems. And you know what one of their sons did? He killed himself. I remember reading an article by his wife, Kay, and she said, you know, when... Their son killed himself. She said, you know what? I felt like I was just in a locked away and nobody could help me and nobody could do anything. And I remember her, in the article she described, they would get Christmas cards from members of their church and other people they've known through the years. And you know, for Christmas, she couldn't open a single one. She just made a stack of them. And the stack grew pretty tall. And then she said, you know, after New Year's happened, Christmas was passed, she said, you know, I'm going to open those cards. 
And she said some cards didn't help a bit, made things worse, and some cards made things a little bit better. She said, you know what the cards that were the worst cards she received? Family photos. Have you ever put a family photo in a Christmas card? And, you know, usually it's, you know, showing off, you know, kids, grandkids, and, and you know what? The, the problem is with a family photo at that moment to her, she could never do a family photo again with her son in it. And she said when she saw those cards, she just burst into tears. The other group of cards, she said, you know, some put their normal letter. Have you ever written a Christmas card and put a letter about the past year? It's pretty common. And she said, those cards didn't really help me much because, you know what, my past year has been like I'm locked in a cell. Some people just wrote K, I'm praying for you. Love in their name. And she said those people, that reminder of people, you know, cared about her. And her grief and her problems that year, it's hard to put into words. But she said some people just wrote a little note. And she could see they could understand her grief. But they pointed her to Jesus. And she said those were the only cards that really spoke to my soul. Because you know what? Jesus opened eyes that can't see. Jesus allows people to hear who cannot hear a thing. Jesus makes people the lame walk. Jesus preaches good news to the poor. Even heals the lepers. And Jesus is the only one who raises the dead. And that's the only thing she really cared about at that moment in time. Because that was the place she was suffering the most in life. And you know what? I think when those people experienced and did this and shared Jesus with her, that became a Kairos time. A time where the message and the promise and the joy of Jesus is powerful. Do you know, a challenge in, in the church, um, we do this all the time. We kill time, we waste time, we pass time. But really the church is to be a place that is Kairos time. It's Jesus, Christocentric. It's the sacrament, it's the word of God. It's hearing, do you know what? We've got problems, and, and, and I, I would guarantee probably almost most people in this room haven't done time. But we all face struggles. We all face hardships. And Jesus is the one who speaks to every one of those issues. Listen to him. Share his words. And you make a special time. God's time. Do you know the, the, the last thing, just in closing, just thinking about this passage has a lot of things that I can talk about. But the last thing, you know, Jesus, when talking about John the Baptist, what does he say? Among people born of women, who's he? The greatest. But then he says something interesting after that. What does he say? But you know who's even greater than him? The least in the kingdom of heaven. The least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. You know who's least in the kingdom of heaven? We are. And you know how we become even in the kingdom of heaven. It happens because of the grace and the love and the forgiveness of Jesus. Because we take upon his righteousness, his perfection. John was a sinner like all of us. 
He's a prophet off the, off the charts. But he had doubts, he had questions. But I love this. This is from 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. That's Jesus on the cross. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. We're greater than John the Baptist because we're in the kingdom of heaven. We have the righteousness of Christ, the perfection of Jesus. When God sees us, he sees Jesus forgiving us, loving us, and blessing every one of us. And that's God's timing. And that's what we share with each other and with the world. In Jesus' name, amen. We now gather our offerings for our Lord.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day and every good and perfect gift. For they come from your gracious hand. And Lord, we pray for those who are struggling in time, in some of the hard seasons of life. And all of us go through those seasons. Help those who struggle and who are going through a difficult time. And Lord, may we, as your people, share the wonders of Jesus, who is our Savior, our friend, who is Emmanuel, God with us, each and every day. And Lord, we thank you. Comfort those who are sick, who are mourning, who are at unease, who need your peace, your healing, and your gracious hand. And we remember them. We pray for healing for the family of Charlie Daniels. And Lord, be with them and bring them. We also pray for healing and good test results for Jennifer, the niece of Peg Rankin. And Lord, we pray for healing for Sasha Powell, the daughter of Pastor Farnsworth and Tammy. And Lord, for all those who need healing and help, Jesus is the one who gives sight to the blind, who even raises the dead, and who preaches good news to us and to this world in need of the good news of Jesus. We pray, you for, we pray for all people, for pastors, for congregations, for missionaries, for your people in harm's way, in any place and corner of this globe, we pray your will be done. And we pray together the prayer that you taught us to praise. Pray. We rise and pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured forth for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We join in the next hymn, Make Me a Servant.
And now the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our closing hymn is Emmanuel. As a reminder of the reason why we exist as a church, let us speak our vision statement together. Through word and sacrament ministry, we share the love, joy, and peace of Jesus Christ among ourselves and with those around us. Our worship has ended. Our service now begins. Let us go, let us go in peace and serve the Lord.